You know, they, they, they do some really fast takeoffs in all these airports, you know, literally to think, man, I was in Managua just a few hours ago and I was in El Salvador just a few hours ago. And um, think about that. I want to show you, I, I brought a video. This is what my, this is what my takeoff looked like this morning. I did this on my iPhone. You guys check this out. I'm going to do a sharp left turn. Dun, 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 Boom! That's what I'm talking about. I like the old time lapse. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, you like that? Thank you very much. Did nine and a half G's. Awesome. It's about a five minute period right there. Isn't that cool to have that feature on your phone, the, the time lapse thing? I just think that's cool. Yeah, so um, Sunday after church, uh, we left, and me and Brother Giles and Jerry and Brother Les, uh, we all jumped on a plane right after church on Sunday, and we went down and we went to El Salvador at. Uh, we had a layover there, and then we arrived down in um, uh, Managua at about midnight. And then Giles got pulled over and sent to the ugly room because you're not allowed to bring cameras in Nicaragua. We didn't know that, and he happened to have four on him. Thank you very much. <laughs> And we had to deal with your local friendly socialist, hallelujah. And, uh, but God did a miracle and we got all the way through that. And we got, I mean, a great miracle, it really did. But it took several hours and, and uh, but nonetheless, uh, we got through it and praise God for that. And all the people said, hey, it was a great miracle. Whenever we were first there, um, they actually had a sign and they were holding up this sign. It's like the, I think it's the one, two, three, four, five, the fifth picture. They were actually had this big sign in the airport and, uh, and then all, at all the crusades that we did this week, they also had those signs that was there as well. And guys, I want you to know that the Nicaraguan church loves you. And they think Open Door is the greatest church that there ever was. And, uh, and they think we have, we're, that, sadly, they think we have our act together, which, you know, <laughs> which we don't claim. We, I don't claim that. So... But with that said, uh, the people in Nicaragua truly do love us, guys, and God, God is doing a great and a mighty work there. Uh, one of the things that I love about uh, Nicaragua is I love the volcanoes that's down there, and we saw some next level volcanoes. I got a picture uh, from there. You guys are next. Listen, I will travel anywhere just go see a volcano. I love volcanoes, and I like them when they're erupting. That's when I like them. And uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big deal to be able to see that. And, and then of course, guys, we hooked up with the body of Jesus while we were there and we did pastor's conferences the whole time that we were there. This is a picture of a man of God worshiping and you can kind of see the arena that we were in. Um, and we literally ministered to thousands and thousands of pastors while we were there, thousands and thousands of pastors. And they were all pastors and it was incredible. Um, I want to show you another picture. In fact, I got a video. I mean, I want to. I want to show you guys this video, guys. Let's crank up the sound on this so that you can actually hear this. So there's about two thousand pastors there. Those are all pastors. Their band was really good too. This was yesterday. Yep. And guys, we're more than two thousand pastors there. Um, and all of them just come in to give testimony and to praise God for the difference that we're making down in Nicaragua. And it was amazing. It was, it was truly amazing. The spirit of the Lord moved in an incredible way. Also, I ran into my good friend, Sierra. You guys know Sierra? I got a picture of Sierra. She's an open door girl and she's actually a missionary in uh, Nicaragua um, right now. And she's such a good girl. And she spent the whole day with us and and danced before the Lord and went to our conferences and we got to ride on the bus together. And, and dude, she just speaks Spanish like crazy. And uh, a year ago, you know, she didn't speak Spanish and I haven't seen her in a year. And she's like, hola, Dios te bendiga, you know, doing her thing, right? Yeah, right on. And uh, she's just talking to everybody, very, very, very conversational. Man, that's a cool thing to see somebody who who didn't speak the language a year ago, just ministering to people and talking and doing all that kind of cool stuff. We had armed guards that was with us the whole time and uh, they provided a security team for us, which we were very grateful for. 
And at the end of the week, um, I, actually last night, uh, we were getting, they were getting ready to leave and to go on. And they said, Pastor Troy, will you please pray for us? And so we'd made a tremendous impact just on those guards being around us all week. And they literally got down on their knees and asked me to bless them and to pray for them. We have a picture of that. So it was powerful. So uh, my alarm clock went off at 2 a.m. this morning. And me and Giles met downstairs at 3 o'clock. And at 3 o'clock, we jumped on the bus and we drove to Managua Airport and we went through all their customs, which is interesting. And we got all the way through that and our flight left at uh, five o'clock and then we went to El Salvador and we were there for a couple of hours and then we got here a few hours ago and here I am tonight. And I gotta tell you why I'm here. I gotta tell you why I'm here and I gotta tell you what it is that we're doing down here because I know that you've probably heard me share bits and pieces of this, but I'd like to give you the full story. Is that okay? Okay. I think it's real important to just connect the dots. If you're gonna live a prophetic lifestyle, you have to connect the dots and make a big deal out of the things that are a really big deal. And most people, they just miss it. And I wanna tell you, it's a great offense to God whenever God does incredible miracles within your life and you yawn because something else is going on and you didn't catch the miracle. Jesus himself towed five different cities that was on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus told them, he said, you know what? If I'd have done the miracles that I've done for y'all in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. And I've done such great things for you and still you will not repent. And it's a great offense to the Lord for King Jesus to do incredible things and for us to not connect the dots and go, that's a big deal. That's miraculous. That's Jesus. That's part of living a grateful lifestyle before the Lord. I mean, how many hoops does Jesus have to jump through in order for you to finally go, yeah, this is probably a God thing, right? And I think if there's, any, if there's not anything else that you catch out of what I'm saying to you tonight is this, your awareness of the Holy Spirit within your life, your awareness of, of who God is and what he's doing within your life is your responsibility and it's nobody else's responsibility. We have to mark those things and we have to make a big deal out of it and we can't expect everybody else to celebrate what it is that we're celebrating because the Lord's showing it to us and he's not showing it to them. And most of us are afraid to actually say, I had this dream or I saw this number and then the next day this happened and that happened because they're like, oh, they're gonna think I'm crazy. I don't give a rip who thinks I'm crazy, amen? I gotta have Jesus in my life. And I gotta walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I love it when people do appreciate what I appreciate, but I have learned that if they don't up front, they will afterwards and they'll say that they did in the beginning. Right, isn't that the way that human beings are? So it's like, ah, it's okay. They'll think this is cool later on. And I think, I think probably if I, if I take you all the way through the journey of what we're doing in Nicaragua, how we got started, what we're doing, how we got started, when I lay it out like, like how I'm about to lay it out, of course it's a miracle. Of course it is. Of course it's miraculous. Of course it's incredible. But it happened in the course of natural events where I wasn't sure all the way through it. It's like you can have the most, the craziest dream in the whole world that, that to all of us after the miracle happens, of course that was a God dream. But when you woke up, it felt like, you know, you had too many mushrooms on your pizza. <laughs> and so you just roll over and go right back to sleep, right? But man, guys, we have to be willing to steward the things that God has given us. And I, I wanna just tell you, I, I, everybody thinks I'm a smart guy and I'm not a smart guy. And I, I have people all the time, Troy, you shouldn't say that. No, I, I'm not saying that in a sense of false humility. I'm not saying that, I'm not putting myself down. I'm just saying it's not my strength. My strength is to be able to connect dots. And that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. It comes from God highlighting things and making my heart leap within me. You know, whenever Jesus walked with the two guys on the way to a certain city, and I've actually done that walk before, and it's straight down a hill and straight up a hill, and it's a very hard walk. You know, they didn't know it was Jesus, and it was just natural, and he was talking to them, and then, and then they all sit down to eat together, and then he disappeared right in front of them after he ate something with them. And they went, of course that was Jesus. I mean, everybody's gonna be talking about for thousands of years the, this miracle story, but it didn't feel like a miracle to us. 
It just felt so natural and it just, it just felt like it was no big deal. And man, didn't, my, didn't our hearts burn within us as he walked with us by the way? Of course that was miraculous, duh. And that's the way it always is because miraculous is not religious. And everybody is looking for the miraculous to be religious when many times the miraculous, the most miraculous thing you can possibly imagine is just in the course of everyday events. And you have to be able to note it. And I'm amazed at people who say, I've never seen a miracle. I'm like, that's on you. That's totally 100% on you. And while I'm nice to people that say, Pastor Troy, you pray for me because I've never seen a miracle. What I pray for is God, turn their sight away from their selfishness and let them be able to see. Give them an eye to see and an ear to hear, Lord. Because all they're feeling is how hurt they are, how people are speaking ill of them, the problems that they have throughout the day, uh, how they gotta pay one more bill. And God, you're doing miracles for them and they're clueless. Now, I don't wanna speak as a hypocrite, excuse me, because there's no telling how many miracles I've missed. But, but there have been times where I went, ah, I know what this is. And I'm walking in this. About 20 years ago, my good friend Steve Fish, who pastors Convergence Church, <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink. Is that all right? I just got through eating a bunch of tortilla chips and they're me up. <laughs> Hang on, wait. <laughs> I think I'm going to be all right now. About 20 years ago, a good friend of mine by the name of Steve Fish, he pastors Convergence Church in Fort Worth. He invited me to go to Nicaragua with him. Um, I've been in Nicaragua a bunch of times, but just barely across the border from Costa Rica. We used to do a big, a big work in the northern part of Costa Rica 20 years ago, and we'd always just go across the border, but that was about the extent of it. He told me that there was going to be a pastor's event and uh, come, and he, he asked me to preach. Now, Steve had some of the greatest preachers on the planet Earth come into his church at that time, and still does. And for him to invite me to come and preach was like, what? I had a church of maybe 50 people. I, nobody knew who I was. I, you know, I was like, okay. And Steve is one of the most, he's one of the healthiest people in the world to travel with. You ever been around people that are just healthy to be around? You know, man, you just get a right mind. You get a right heart when you get around. So man, guys, you need more of those people in your life. And Steve was one of those guys, and I traveled with him, and we went down there, and I'm just gonna just, I'm just gonna go ahead and just tell you this. Steve, Steve was so gracious to me in that. He introduced me to everybody that he knew. Steve is a super fit guy. He's real, very athletic. Uh, at the time that he took me, I probably weighed 400 pounds. I was so overweight. And I wasn't much to look at, I wasn't much to listen to, I didn't have anything to offer. And Steve saw something in me and he wanted, to, he wanted to give to me and he was so nice to me. Aren't you appreciative of the people that when you were down and you didn't have much to offer, they were good to you during that time? Steve Fish was very much like that to me. He offered me his wisdom all the time. I would meet with him and we'd meet at a restaurant and we would talk out things and I would talk about how the prophetic works and he would train me and how to be a leader and all those kinds of things. So it was something like that. We went down there and we did these amazing conferences and there was this incredible uh, Christian uh, a youth band that was playing and they filled up this entire stadium and uh, it was incredible. And they were an amazing band. And Steve told them, this guy plays guitar. And they said, do you wanna play? And I was like, uh, what, 8,000 screaming people? Okay, <laughs> let's do that. And I got out there, man, and they let me just have this lead on this awesome song, and I just rocked it out, and I was banging my head for Jesus, and I was having a good time. And, and then I got up and I preached, and the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me in an incredible way, and I began to prophesy to people. And this one girl, this teenage girl that was on the third row, I prophesied to her, and I, wanna, I, I called her out, and she stepped out, and I knew that she was a sexual slave. I knew it. And it was like, I don't know how the prophetic shows up in your life, but sometimes 
the Spirit of the Lord will show up. It's, it's like the memory part of me. And I don't know where it shows up, but it's like somebody told me that, but I can't remember when, but I know it's true because I remember it, but I'm just now coming into the knowledge of it. Now, I don't know where it shows up in you, but I'm just telling you how it shows up with me. And I remembered from the future that the Lord had told me about this squirrel. And I called her out and I began to speak the Father's love to her. I called her out by name. And you can ask Steve Fish this. Steve was right there and God gave me this girl's name. And I called her out by name and it was her name. And I called her out and told her that the Lord was her father and that he as a father would never abuse her and never hurt her. And I started talking to her like that without trying to shame her in front of everybody and tell everybody what was going on. And I was walking down towards her and I took the microphone away and I said, I know that you are a sexual slave to somebody and Jesus is setting you free right now. And I'm telling you, this girl lost her mind. Literally a demon manifested and came out of her and she got completely set free in every way that a person could be set free. Well, I had just got back from Cuba and I'd been doing a big missions trips. I'd been doing big missions trips in Cuba at that time. And I was sharing with them about what was going on in Cuba and the work that we were doing with the underground church. And we ended up staying at this guy's house by the name of Roger Latham. And Roger, 20 years ago, was 70 years old. And he's, he's 90 now and he's in church here every Sunday. He's down in Nicaragua right now. He's a 90 year old man. Yeah, do you guys know Roger? Do y'all know who I'm talking about? And you might have saw him on some of the videos out there dancing. It's really fun to watch that brother dance. He's like Mean Gene, the dancing machine. That's what he's like. And he was a 70-year-old dude, and, and we stayed up talking and talking about Cuba and talking about Nicaragua and talking about Costa Rica and the, war and, the, and, the, and the work of God within Central America and how important it was. And then after it was all over with, I left and I came back. And then the next year, Steve asked me again, would you like to come to another pastor's conference? Yes, I would. I went back again. And again, we stayed at Roger's house. This, this apostolic dude that has so many pastors and he's, you know, at that time he was 70 years old and he, he'd been in full-time ministry his whole life. And we left there and I came home and then my life changed drastically um, that next year. And it, it changed for the good in a lot of ways. And, and our ministries began to show fruit and we started building orphanages at a higher level. And I want to just tell you, in the midst of all that, the Lord, I, I want to just say this, the wind of the spirit was not for me in Nicaragua. It was in Uganda and it was in India and it was in England and it was in all the places and in Mexico and all the places that, but I really didn't have any more reason to go to Nicaragua, so I didn't. So during that time, for the next 20 years, the Lord began to cause me to, to rescue people. And God began to develop my ministry into a rescue. The, the, the more I began to realize I was rescued, the more I wanted to rescue people. And the very first time I was ever to rescue two little girls, the first time, outside of the baby that I found in the trash dump, the little bitty baby that was just hours old in the trash dump, Outside of that situation, the first time I ever bought a human being, I was in Costa Rica and we were in um, the capital city. And to make a long story short, we were in the really bad part of town and we were doing ministry and outreaches there. And we came across this one nice house in the midst of this terrible slum. And I thought in my ignorance, well, at least somebody has a nice house here. And this lady came out and she talked to us and, you know, she was a, she was a, a, an older woman. She's probably about my age now. I thought, God, mighty that woman's old as the hills, you know, and I don't think that anymore, but she was beautiful and she carried herself well and she was talking and she knew how to, you know, she knew how to carry herself. And she, she brought out these two little uh, Nicaraguan girls. They were obviously Nicaraguan. The Nicaraguans have darker skin and they look quite a bit different from their cousins, the Costa Ricans. And they were obviously refugee children and they were obviously Nicaraguan refugee children. And she's talking and these two little girls were standing in the door, both of them not quite teenagers. 
And she was talking to me and this, the, she was talking in Spanish. She was talking to the two pastors that I was with. And this one pastor turned to me and said, do you know what this lady is offering you? And I said, no, tell me. And he said, she thinks that you're here to molest children and she's trying to sell you those two little girls. And it was the first time I had ever experienced anything like that. I had never, and you, you know, you can imagine if you were not prepared for a moment like that, and it hits you and the horror of what's taken place and the 10 million different kinds of feelings you get at one time in that with no experience at all on how to handle this situation. And I was just like, what? I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should start yelling and hollering, if I should be quiet, if I should just try and get out of there or whatever. And it just occurred to me, the Lord just kind of put it on my heart. Look at those two little girls. And I didn't want to look at them. And I didn't want to look at them because they thought I was there to molest them. And I didn't want to look at them. And the Lord put it on my heart. Look at these two little girls. And I just kind of stopped what I was doing. I was looking down at the ground and I looked up at them and they were both staring at me. And I looked in their eyes and I thought, there is no way I'm leaving here without leaving with those two little girls. And I can just remember something came on me and something came alive in me. And I thought, I'm walking out of here with those two little girls and I'm going to put them in this pastor's orphanage that I'm down here with and I'll support them for the rest of their life. And that's going to make a cool story. And my cool story is happening right now, right this second. That's what I thought. So to make a long story short, I just said, I'll bomb, I'll bomb right now. How much? And she told me and I forked out some cash and I paid money for those two little girls and we walked out with them and then we took them to an orphanage. We called ahead and the dude's wife came out to meet them and pick up the two little girls. I had the first time I'd ever had the conversation and I've had the great privilege of having with so many little girls and little boys. Mark this day. Remember this day because this is the day that your life changes. Jesus loves you so much he sent me from the other side of the world to come down here and to get you. And your life is changing today and you're no longer a slave. It's incredible. It's an incredible thing to get to do. <clears throat> so I got those two little girls in there and they were, they were real, you know, they didn't have emotions. They were starving to death. They were sick. They were diseased. They were so beat up and they were so skinny. I mean, they just looked like they were just going to drop dead from starvation at any moment. And they were just little girls. I left there and went and did some prisons and uh, was gone for about a week and I came back and I saw those two little girls. Um, I got to spend an entire day with them before I went back to the airport to fly home and they were completely different girls. They got it that they were rescued and by then they knew that I wasn't a bad guy, that I was a good guy and they knew that I represented Jesus and guys, they loved me so much and Leanna and I supported them all the way until they were in their mid-twenties. And they're married and they got their own kids now. And that was the first time. And then since that time, through the past 20 some odd years, you know, we've actually rescued more than 10,000, more than 10,000 boys and girls in different nations throughout the world. And I don't take any credit for that, though, you know, other people want to take credit for that. I'm not going to take credit for it. And I have been the tip of the spear, but the Lord has just done so many miracles, man, to make those things happen. I, I can't, it's hard for me to, it's just unbelievable. So fast forward now and, and understand that the very first two, the first time I ever was able to rescue a child, it happened to be a Nicaraguan child and there was two of them. Fast forward to 2019. 2019, uh, it was a Saturday night. Our church was blowing up. Uh, all, of our all of our television ministry was blowing up. We'd gone from saving, you know, 50 girls a year or 20 girls a year to thousands and thousands of girls a year. God was doing incredible things. I'm preaching conferences all over the world. We're getting ready for the big 2020 conference. Oh my gosh, this, this is a shining time, right? 2019 was just absolutely amazing. And on a Saturday night, me and Leanna crawled in bed and we went to sleep. And then the next morning I woke up to a waking dream and the dream had gone like this. 
I was in my bed and I was asleep in the bed that I was sleeping in. I could see myself. And while I could see myself, I could see exactly how I was laying. I could see Leanna laying next to me and Leanna was to my left. And in my dream, I went from seeing myself to actually being me. And I turned to the right and I looked, which means I'm facing south. And I looked past my bed to the floor and then there's the bathroom wall. And then I looked past the wall and I could see through the wall. Then I could see outside and then I could see past Somerville County. And then I could see past Erath County. And then I could see all the way down to the border. And then I could see past the curvature of the earth. And I could see actually through the earth and I could see all the way. I could see Mexico and I could see Honduras and I could see Belize and I could see Guatemala. And then I can see El Salvador and then I could see Nicaragua and then boom, I see this explosion and I see this ball of light leave there and it starts coming up through the curvature of the earth and it's coming towards me at super lightning fast speed and I thought, I need to get dressed. Somebody's fixing to come and see me. So I get up and I get dressed and I walk out of my bedroom and I walk to the front door and I open up the drawer. I open up the door and I step out into my yard. Just the front door is wide open. I'm standing right next to this big open door and I'm standing there and I'm looking and I see this ball of light coming, 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 coming so fast. And then boom, it goes into real time and this woman walks out of this light towards me. And she's walking in real time and she just walks right straight up to me. And there was two things about her that just absolutely blew my mind. And one was this. She's so beautiful. She's supernaturally beautiful. And when I looked at her, I knew how much Jesus loved her. And I could feel the Father's love towards her. And I could feel the love of Jesus towards her as his bride. And it was totally overwhelming. I was like, oh my, how Jesus loves this woman. Oh my goodness, this woman is so loved. And then as she stepped closer into the light from the open door, I saw that not only was she incredibly beautiful, but she was also so skinny and so beat up. I could see that something terrible had happened to her and she was so skinny and she didn't look like that until she came into the light and this weird oxymoron of she's so beautiful yet she's so skinny and so beat up at the same time was going on and while I'm standing there trying to process that she said hello Troy and I said hello and she said do you know who I am and I said no ma'am I do not and she said I am Nicaragua come and feed me I just felt the Lord when I just said that. And I woke up. And I woke up and I went, looked at the clock and it was 444. Kia David. And I want to tell you, even at that moment, after having that profound of a dream and telling you like this, of course we would know that was a dream from God, but it didn't feel like it. It just felt like the weirdest dream I'd ever had. What a strange weirdo dream. And look, it's 444, and I didn't think, that's a confirmation from the Lord. I thought, I better go to sleep. I got to preach in the morning. <laughs> really? That's exactly what I thought. And this is the way it is with supernatural people, because supernatural people are also natural people. And so I started to go, I just rolled back over, and I started to go to sleep. I started to go to sleep. I'm almost asleep. And Leanna goes, what's the matter? She could tell I was awake. And I said, oh, I just had this weirdo dream. And she goes, was it the Lord? And I said, yeah, it was probably the Lord. I was starting to go back to sleep. And she said, get up and write it down. And I went, oh, yeah, I need to get up and write that down. Dude, that was an awesome dream. And honestly, man, if I'd have been married to anybody else in the world, I would have lost that. And it's just, I just can't tell you how important it is that we encourage each other to walk the walk no matter how weird it is. It's just so important. It's just so important. And so I got up and wrote it all down and then I came to church that morning and I don't, I'm sure there's somebody here that was actually here on that Sunday morning when I got up and said, guys, I had this dream last night. I gotta tell you about it. So Mama Virginia, you were here, right? And I got up and told everybody about it. Just said, guys, this is the deal, pickle, man. God gave me this weird dream and I know that we're gonna end up doing a food bank down there. So I got to thinking, what was the name of that dude that I stayed in his house? 
20 years before. And then I honestly thought, oh, he's dead. That was 20 something years ago. And he's a 70 year old dude. See, I'm telling you, listen, I'm trying to tell you, this didn't happen because I'm Mr. Mega Faith dude. <laughs> I'm just a dude like anybody else. And, and I'm just being real about the process of how this worked for me. And so I, st- I, st- I asked somebody who knew him, and he said, yeah, no, man, he's alive, and he's around. He goes, I don't know. He's down there doing something. I'll have to check around and see if I can find his number. And I went, okay. And then I didn't hear from that person. Then I asked somebody else, hey, man, do you know this guy, Roger? Do you know him? Yeah, I do know him, and I think he lives in the United States somewhere now. I'm like, okay, I guess, I guess that wasn't the Lord. I don't know. I, I just think that's the only connection I have. So on a Wednesday night, about two months after that, I'm up here, and I was tuning my guitar, and we were having practice, and I was standing right over there, and I see the door open up, and Pastor Les comes walking in, and he's on his way to go take this man to Pastor Daryl. And he had heard of this man, and he had he'd just gone to Fellowship of the Sword, and he had had this amazing encounter with King Jesus, and there was a guy there who said, man, my uncle is this you know, big time church leader in Nicaragua, and you know what, he's always looking for people that do outreaches, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll hook you up with Pastor Daryl. And I'm standing right here, this is where I'm standing at, it's right here. And I'm like, do, to do, I'm trying to tune my guitar, always takes me forever to tune, do, to do, do, to do. And I look, and Roger Latham comes walking right past me. And I'm watching him, I'm watching him like, that is that dude from Nicaragua that I stayed in his house 20 some odd years ago. I, the guy who I had originally thought that's who I need to be connected with and then couldn't figure out how to be. And I said, hey, Les. He said, yeah, man. And I said, who is this? Oh man, this is Pastor Roger. And man, he does a good thing down, in, down, down there in Nicaragua. <laughs> and I'm like, Roger. Yes. It's me, Troy. No. Because last time he saw me, you know, I was this fat. And last time he saw me, I had a church that was a little bitty tiny shack off of 1902. And he's walking into this amazing place, seeing this good looking guy up here playing guitar. And he did not recognize me. And he's like, what? And I was like, Roger, it's me, Troy. And dude, right then, I knew, okay, it's all like Donkey Kong. And so we go in there, and I said, Roger, I got to tell you about this dream I had. And he said, okay, but I got to tell you something, Troy. And he goes, I got to tell you something. And so what? He goes, I'm here, and you know me, and I don't know any of these other new pastors. I don't know any of them. He goes, you know me. He goes, you know the work I do down there? Yes. And he goes, listen, we've got to build a food bank. People are starving to death. And I'm trying to find a pastor to partner with me to build a food bank. And yeah. And and Les and Daryl are just going, you, oh my gosh. And immediately, I'm telling you, when this is all happening, they're all looking at me like, man, Troy's got his act together. <laughs> and I just told you the process of how it happened. I, didn't, I did not have my act together in that. The Lord had to just really help a brother into a blessed place. And we told him the dream and he started bawling and squalling. And I'm just gonna just tell you, he, I told him, I said, look, I gotta, I gotta preach tonight and I need to go back to band practice. Come back tomorrow and ask me and tell me what you want. The next day he came back and I met with Barry and I met with Jerry and I said, you guys need to pray for me because I'm gonna say yes to anything this guy asked for and it's liable to wreck us. <laughs> Would you not at this point have the fear of the Lord upon you? Like, what am I going to do? Juggle it? Oh, I don't know. Let me pray about it. Hey, hey, hey. Like, I don't think so. Like, I had the fear of the Lord upon me. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you what I told him. I said, ask me for anything up to a million dollars and I'll give it to you. And I don't have a million dollars. 
I know how to get a loan for a million dollars. And I thought, God, please don't ask me for a million dollars. <laughs> I just found out what I could apply for for a loan, and it was a million bucks. And I was like, if this guy asks me for a million dollars, I'm going to tell him yes, and I'm going to go get a loan this week, and I'll figure out a way to pay it off. I'm going to say yes. And he didn't ask me for a million dollars. What he asked me for was $60,000. And I said, yes. And we had no budget for it. We had no budget for it whatsoever. Jeff's back there. Jeff remembers all this. Jeff's on my board. How would you like to be on my board, y'all? But I had a dream. <laughs> you can't call this financial irresponsibility. I'm a dreamer. <laughs> it's hard, y'all. I... I <laughs> He asked me for $60,000, and I said yes. And I got one on my board, and said, let's find a way to come up with $60,000. I have to obey the Lord. And I told him, I said, guys, I cannot say no to this. You guys can override me, and you can tell me no, and I blame you. <laughs> That's what I told him. <laughs> and then you can have your own dreams. And so, at the end of the week, guys, we had written out a check for $60,000. I want to I tell you that we've been supporting our food bank there big. We spend more money on our food bank in Nicaragua than we spend on the Open Door Food Bank here. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's tens of thousands of dollars a month. And we have for three years. And I hadn't told you all one time. They never said anything about it because it's just something that the Lord told me to do. And it's been hard. It's been hard for us to keep that commitment. And it's been, it's been, it hasn't been easy keeping our commitment. So I haven't been down there to see it until today. <laughs> and uh, on Thursday, we went down there and spent the night. And on Monday, we got up and we went to all these pastors. And I want to tell you what has happened. What has happened is... The pastors there are so hurt because of what's going on in their nation and just because of the difficult things that have happened. And it's a long, long, long story, but I totally get it. And Roger's idea of a food bank was not like our idea of a food bank. Roger's idea of a food bank was this. I'm gonna turn every single church that is in our apostolic network into a food distribution center so that the pastors have hope and that they can take care of their own congregations. And then as they hand out food, they're gonna pray for them and signs and miracles and wonders are going to take place and they're gonna be revived in a pastoral work because they actually have something to work with instead of watching their people starve. It was, it was so genius. And I saw it this week. And I saw a room of over 2,000 pastors weep and say thank you and told me to tell you, thank you. You have no idea. I can't tell you how many people told me, you have no idea what it means to us to be able to feed our congregation. You have no idea. I mean, they, it's like we had nothing. We had nothing to offer. And just with the food came miracles with the food. And guys, y'all know that that's true with us, right? With the food comes miracles. We're not in the food business. We're in the Jesus business and business is good, right? And, and, and with the food has come leadership and with the food has come this and with the food has come that and all these kinds of things. And guys, they're just doing it and it's amazing. It's truly amazing. And me and Pastor Jerry and Pastor Les and Giles, we all, we watched this and we're like, okay, it's not what we thought it was, which we knew it wasn't a food bank in the sense of how we call it a food bank. But they were saying, they were saying things that, and we were like, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that we're, that we're feeding 100,000 people a month. Like, how can that possibly be? No, I saw it. I understand it now. It's, we're impacting through that food 100,000 people a month. That those churches serve 100,000 people. 
And they're feeding those people and praying for those people and taking care of those people. And they have something to work with now. And they get together and they have to be unified. This is something else too. In order to receive this food, you got to be unified. You got to be in the network. (laughs) And so it all goes back to that dream that I had. And it didn't occur to me until I was on a stage in front of 2,000 of those pastors. It did not occur to me but how much that that woman who was actually the church of Nicaragua, the beautiful woman that came to me, how that she was so much like those two little Nicaraguan girls that we first rescued. So, so beautiful. And so, so beat up and skinny. The Lord brought that church to me, Nicaragua, in the form of a beat up woman because God knows two things about us. We're gonna rescue girls that need to be rescued (laughs) and we're gonna feed people that need to be fed. And this time, the girl that we rescued was Jesus' girl himself, his bride, the church in Nicaragua. And guys, I promise you, the day will come, you and I will stand before King Jesus and the Lord is gonna show us the impact that, is, that we've made. It may, in many ways, be the most impactful thing we have ever done through Open Door Church. And I don't know how you measure any of that. I don't know how you, I don't know how you can do metrics on any of that. But I can just tell you that how God lined this up for me and how God made it happen and how he, how he got me to pull the trigger was so wise on his part. And then how he brought Roger in here. <laughs> and then I got to see what so many people never get to see. They actually saw the fruit of what their hard work had done, the fruit of what their commitment is. And I want to tell you why I think that God let me see that, because it's not just my commitment. It's, it's our commitment as a church. And the Lord has shown me what radical faithfulness, because of a dream, because of a vision, because of connecting crazy dots and believing it's Jesus can do, and how it can impact people. And friends, I want to encourage you and just tell you this. However crazy you are for King Jesus, you're not near crazy enough. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Awesome. Okay. Well, you're going to be hearing stories about that for a long time to come. And then also, Giles was with me. He did tons and tons of video. He filmed all of my conferences I did. And we're going to put all that on odx.tv. And so you'll be able to, you guys will be able to start going with me into all these radical places because Giles is going with me everywhere and we're filming all this stuff and putting up our videos and all that kind of stuff. And we're actually going to make some TV shows out of it. We were on, uh, when I preached in front of those 2,000 people, we were on in Lasse uh, TV. And I don't know if you know what that is. And so we were on in Lasse and it's millions and millions of people saw it. I did a whole bunch of television interviews. I, I did an interview with Channel 21. I did an interview with Channel 7. I did... Blah, blah, blah. I got to do, there was all kinds of media that happened down there because everybody wanted to see who is this church that has about, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in it. Well, it's just us. It's this bunch of yahoos right here. Hallelujah. It's just us. It's just, it's just us, man. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a special leader or special people. It's just people who would just say yes and will not bail. I just can't tell you how important it is, guys, no matter how insignificant that you think it is, to just say yes and do not bell from your commitment. The Lord is in that.